continuing kind of the theme that was uh, laid out last weekend for this coming year. Well, we're in it now, 2017. I can't refer to it as coming year anymore. Um, the emphasis this year that the Holy Spirit has, has given to me in my heart, uh, probably about a month ago, I hate when that happens, um, <clears throat> was that this is the year for this congregation, I say specifically for this congregation, um, because this is the congregation that I'm responsible for. Uh, this is the year that we are going to grow and develop as a congregation into becoming very much more aware of what's happening in the realm of the spirit, where I'm, I'm calling it eyes on eternity, uh, for us to become a little bit more disconnected to, to the things that have just gripped us in this world. Many of you are going through things or have been going through things, and when you go through trials, when you go through challenges, you just automatically become obsessed with that situation. And uh, because of the way things have been with the economy and, and just life in general has just become so complicated, um, many, many Christians have become more tied to the concerns of this world, the concerns of this life, and paying less attention to this life being an investment for eternity. Amen? Because we're going to be spending a whole lot more time in eternity than we're spending here on earth. Even if you live to be 100 years old, it's nothing compared to uh, eternity. And so uh, I thought that the best way to start off this year as far as teaching goes would be in talking about the subject of purpose. I know for many years, um, I noticed something throughout the years, uh, in the position that I've been in life, whether in ministry or in business, you always find yourself relating to people and just being in a relationship or acquaintanceship with individuals. You have a lot of people around you when you're in business. You have a lot of people around you that you're exposed to when you're in the ministry. And one thing I've noticed over the years is this, that the people that are the most frustrated, the individuals that I've met in my life that have lived lives frustrated, the ones that I've seen the most frustrated, <clears throat> excuse me, are the ones who have the least idea what their purpose is. And there's a reason, there's a de de definite connection there. When you don't know why you're here, when you don't know what your purpose is, when you don't really have, and you haven't stepped into it, there is a level of frustration. There's a level of dissatisfaction. We're gonna talk about that. But I, I believe that God created us with two types of hunger. Number one, instinctively, as a human being, we have a hunger to know Him. Now, I'm not talking about just Christians. I'm talking about people in general. Every person that's been born on this earth, every person that ever will be born on this earth, has this thing on the inside. We know instinctively that there is, there is someone out there, if I could put it that way. We know instinctively that there is a God. We, that's why there's so many different forms of type of searching for God that has crept up into humanity for, uh, for, since Adam and Eve all these different ways of trying to reach God. And I'm not saying that, I'm not endorsing those things. What I'm saying is that, that the reason why every civilization, every human being on this earth, one, to one extent or another, has a knowing on the inside that there is someone that has created us, someone who is a higher power, whatever you want to call it. We've been, we've been made, it's inbred in us, it's an instinctive thing for us to have a hunger to know where we came from. What are we here for? The other one, number two, is a hunger to know ourselves and how we fit into the grand design of, of life on planet Earth. Amen? Um, Moses is probably a good example of a person who struggled to discover his purpose. And that's the theme that we're following for this month, discovering our purpose. And we're starting out today by laying this foundation. Now, follow me through Moses' life. You know, we can't go, obviously, in, uh, in uh, detail, but we're just going to do an overview here. He, he's born at a time where Pharaoh decides he wants to eliminate the Israelites. He's rescued from the Nile. He's adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. He's raised in the palace. He is exposed to the finest minds of Egypt. The historian Josephus, which you can go and Google his name and, and go look it up, and you'll see to this day you can read the history of the Jews that he wrote 2,000 years ago. In his history of the Jews that he wrote for the Roman Empire, so that the Roman uh, officials wanted to know who are these people that we've conquered. They're very distinct, very different than all the other people that in the empire. They wanted to know who are these Jews? What do they believe? What are, what are they about? And so they had captured this man, Josephus, and he kind of made a deal with them. You leave me alive, I'll write this history of the Jews. And so in his history that he wrote, 
talking about Moses, he refers to Moses as a genius at engineering and architecture. He also has written, has recorded for us the fact that Moses led the armies of Egypt to defeat the Ethiopians, which Ethiopian was south of Egypt. And at one point there was a conflict during the time that Moses was there. And he literally led the armies of Egypt to defeat the Ethiopians. So this, we see in history, there's some things that we're not told about in the Bible about Moses' early life. Now he's raised to be a prince of the most powerful empire of his time, yet on the inside, he knew that wasn't his purpose. He was very successful, but it wasn't his purpose. So you could be very successful and be miserable and frustrated at the same time. You could be very successful, but being very, very successful at the wrong things. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, it tells us, Now it came to pass in those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. He was aware that he belonged to these people. He did not belong to the Egyptians. He saw that an Egyptian was beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now let me just read through this, and then we'll go over it. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, the person said to him, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you did the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. In other words, that he had killed the Egyptian the day before. And verse 15 tells us he had to flee from Egypt. And he ends up in the land of Midian, far from Egypt, and says he sat down by a well. Like, it's like, you read stuff like this and you go, do we need to know that, that he sat down by a well? Well, see, the well, wherever you went to a community, the well was the gathering place. The well is where all the people came out. And when you think you're a leader, you want to go someplace or you're drawn to places where people gather. And I believe with all my heart, that's why the Holy Spirit has this written here. But let's go through this now. He understood that there was something different. He understood that as successful as he was and his high prominent place and position he had in the empire, he still wasn't satisfied. There was a tugging in his heart. He knew he belonged to these other group of people who were slaves at that time. And so he's now trying to fulfill. He's trying to answer that tug. He's trying to find his purpose, but he causes a disaster. He murders a man. And because of this, it literally takes him 40 years to recover from this disaster, from this incident. He has to flee Egypt. He goes to a, to a place called Midian, in, kind of in northern Saudi Arabia. And he spends 40 years there recovering from this mistake. 40 years recovering from trying to establish his own purpose without seeking God. Now notice this, because this can happen to any of us. There was a tug in there. There was a knowing that he's supposed to accomplish greater things than just being a prince in Egypt. But because he didn't go to God to get God's plan, he tried to establish his own plan. And establishing his own plan, he shipwrecked his life for one third of it. See, Moses tried to discover his purpose without really seeking the one who created him for a purpose. It's said of Moses that he spent 40 years thinking he was somebody in the palace. 40 years out in the wilderness being a nobody. And then 40 years, because he lives to be 120, 40 years finding out what God can do with a nobody. That's where you and I come in. Um, I personally think that the worst thing that can happen to a person is to allow dissatisfaction to become a lifestyle. Moses obviously was dissatisfied. He went looking for his purpose. That dissatisfaction drove him to, try to, to do something that was counterproductive and actually delayed him stepping into his purpose. But what's worse is when you become so tolerant of dissatisfaction that you think, well, this is just the way it's going to live. I, I know this because I went through this in my early years. Um... By the time I was 26, 27 years old, 
I had a very unhappy childhood, very worse than that, teen years. So by the time I was 25, 26, I had settled in my heart, this is the way life is going to be, someday I'm going to die. At that time, I believed in crazy stuff. And I said, at, at some point in time, I'm going to die, and then I'll come back to something else, and maybe the next life will be better. Thank God that the Lord didn't leave me in that spot. Thank God that the, that the worst part of my dissatisfaction, now the worst part of my dissatisfaction was not when I was suffering. The worst part of my dissatisfaction was when I became convinced that it was never going to change. That for me there was going to be no contentment. There was going to be no stepping into purpose other than just being miserable, unhappy, depressed, discontent. That's the dangerous part. And, and I'm afraid that there's some of us in this room that you've settled into, this is just the way life's going to be. Now, the reason why that's dangerous is because when you tolerate and you get used to and dissatisfaction becomes a lifestyle, you're actually extinguishing the very thing that God wants to use to prompt you to discover your purpose. What am I saying? Well, we want to know why we're on the earth. We desire to know our unique purpose. And instinctively, we know that there's a deeper reason we're on the earth more than just taking up space and sucking up oxygen. But you see, when, the, when, when it's delayed, and sometimes we don't want to go through the discomfort that it's going to take to step into our purpose, you become used to that. It happens in teens. It happens in young adults. It happens throughout every season of life. But the dangerous part is when we come to our later years and realize, I lived my whole life being dissatisfied. I lived my whole life never allowing the discomfort to prompt me to go forward. Um, if I could put it this way, I remember when we were in Bible school, my wife and I were going from one, on the campus that we're at in Tulsa, there's multiple buildings, probably five or six buildings. And we were going from one class to another, required us to leave one building, go to another building. And there was, we had to go outside and go through like a breezeway to get to the next. And there were two individuals behind us. And we were first year students at that time. So first year students back then were looked down upon like, you know, you're just first year students. Um, but there were second year students who, you know, we looked at them as like, they, they've elevated to a whole new, like they're second year students. You know, they're, they're almost there. They're almost out. And I, I could, you know, when the Holy Spirit has you hone in on a conversation that has nothing to do with you, you might be in a diner or a restaurant, and all of a sudden you get tuned into somebody's conversation. That's what happened. I heard this one, the young lady, say to the other young lady, you know, if it wasn't for Pharaoh chasing the Israelites, the Jews would still be in Egypt. And I thought to myself, oh my God, that is such a wealth of wisdom. Because the truth of the matter is all throughout our lives, there are times when God is wanting to propel us. He's wanting to project us forward. He's wanting to launch us. And we're just too scared. And the truth of the matter is, think about the situation with the Israelites, okay? They cross, they, come, they, they leave Egypt, they come uh, to the shores of the Red Sea. And they realize that Pharaoh's army is chasing them. Now, now let me ask you this question. Is God all-powerful? Yes. Is God all-knowing? Yes. Did God know that Pharaoh was going to change his mind and chase them with his, with his army? Yes. Okay. Is he ever present? Yes. yes. So let me ask you this question. Could not God have destroyed the armies of Egypt as soon as they left yes. to chase after the Israelites? He could have wiped them out, right? The ground could have opened, could have swallowed them all. Lightning bolts could have came out of the sky. Whatever he wanted to use. He gets creative. But what happened? He allowed them to make it to the shore of the Red Sea. Who is at the shore of the Red Sea? The Israelites. Now, if you were escaping oppression the way they were, if you're running for your life, and all of a sudden you find yourself, you've got mountains on one side, mountains behind, and you've got this body of water in front of you, and this guy, the leader, says, we're going to cross this, I think you'd get a little suspicious. I think you get a little, like, um, maybe it wasn't that bad in Egypt after all. 
But what happened? God allowed their discomfort level. God allowed their dissatisfaction to just amp right up. Why? You don't think it took faith for them? Yeah, well, you know, Pastor, after all, they saw the Red Sea split. Um, well, go read it in the original language, because the original language tells us that not only did the Red Sea split, but that the waters congealed on both sides. Well, that, that's just, um, oh, if I saw a miracle like that, honey, don't kid yourself. We're not talking about a space from the platform to the back door. We're talking about miles having to walk through on dry ground while the waters have lifted themselves up on both sides and congealed. I don't even like going to the aquarium. <laughs> I get nervous when I got to walk through that tunnel where the fish are all around you. The first time that happened, I thought to myself, I am freaking out. But my grandchildren are all around me, so I've got to act cool. I'm like, isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? Let's go, uh, come on, Bart, let's go quick, because there's people behind us. <laughs> Could you imagine having to walk through that? You got sharks floating by here. You got all stingrays on this side. And you got to, and you got to walk for miles through this thing. And then you get to the midpoint where it's like, I, I, it's just as far to turn around and go back as it is to go through. They needed an incentive. And sometimes, sometimes, we're praying for God to, God, I'm just so dissatisfied. God, I'm so dissatisfied. Take this dissatisfaction away. He's like, no. No, because I, I love you too much to leave you where you are. I've got a purpose for you. You've grown comfortable. Oh, I'm talking to somebody today. You've grown comfortable. And sometimes you just need an incentive to get pushed on. You know, we think dissatisfaction is a bad thing. We want to do everything possible to avoid it. I'm talking about as Christians. We don't like dissatisfaction. Hey, I'm born again. I'm a child of the king. I'm supposed to be happy. I'm supposed to be content. Well, there's contentment. There's joy when you walk in your purpose. That doesn't mean there's ever going to be challenges. But the way you face a challenge when you know that you're in the purpose of God is way different than facing a challenge when you're not too sure you're doing what God wants you to do. Big difference. Your confidence level is completely different. And so we want to avoid it. We want to shove it down. We want to, we want to just push it down. We want to act like it doesn't bother us. But we need to consider the fact that maybe God is using dissatisfaction like he did Pharaoh's army to get us to go, to get us to move, to get us to pick up, to get us to, to start thinking different, to start acting different, to start speaking different. Because he wants to make changes in our life. And this is the best time of the year for us to consider a message like this. I don't want to see any of us experience another year of frustration. Dissatisfaction can also be an indicator that maybe you were, right on, you were on the right track, but something changed. You either allowed somebody to speak into your life or something happened to get you off course, and you went from a place of satisfaction, a place of contentment, a place of knowing that you're in the purpose of God, but God didn't change, and the purpose didn't change, you changed. Something happened, you let something come in, and it took you off track. It's no big deal, it happens. Get back on track. Rediscover your purpose. Get in God's face and stay there. Amen? Amen. Now, bottom line is, do not forget that we have a Savior who gave his life so that you and I could step into the purpose that God has for our life. Do not settle for less. I don't know how much stronger I can make this. We've only got a number of decades on this earth. Do not settle for less. Now, I want to balance this out because many of you have heard me say very recently that we put too much, too much emphasis on those few decades. And, and, and rightfully so, because we do have an eternity that we're going to be living. But by the same token, and I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm in it now. I've got to go through it. By the same token, what you and I are doing here on this earth 
I'm talking about since we became Christians. And what do I mean by became Christians? Since we came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is who the Bible says he is. And that in our hearts we do believe that he is God. We believe that he's, he's our savior. We believe that he died on the cross for our sins. And we want him in our life. And we receive him in our life. And we commit our life to his. From that point forward, what you and I do here on this earth is going to determine what reward we receive and what quality of life we live in eternity. It's, de- it's going to be de- it's decided here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a few minutes. But consider this. We have a Savior that believes so much in us, that cares so much of, about us. And John 10.10 10 says this. Jesus said that the thief, we know the thief is the enemy of our souls. The thief does not come except for one reason. Well, three reasons. To do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come, he said, that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now listen to me. That is a a much quoted scripture. Many of us are familiar with that. And that is a danger. When you become so familiar with, with, with the scripture that you don't bother to study it anymore, that you don't bother to pick it apart, and that you don't bother to say, okay, I knew what this meant in the season of life 20 years ago, but what does it mean to me now in this season of life? You see, sometimes we miss our purpose because we become too familiar with a scripture that maybe God used at a particular season in our life, but now wants to take that scripture, blow the dust off of it, because he wants us to see it in a fresh new way. Jesus said, I've come here that they would experience, they talking about us, experience life in super abundance. Well, listen to me, church. How do you and I experience life in super abundance if we're not walking in his purpose that he's assigned to us? If we're not taking up the very reason he created us, how are you gonna experience abundance? Now, let me give you a little story along those lines. My wife and I met when we were teenagers. I kind of knew the first time we talked, this is my wife. A few years went by. But we were very young. At 19 years old, I started my first business. I believe I was 19 or 20 when we got engaged. I was 20 when we got engaged. Bought our first piece of property at 20 years old. Who does that? First piece of property right here in this neighborhood. Built a brand new house on it. By the time I was 26, 27 years old, we owned not only that house, we had a business and had a two-family house on the other side of town that was constantly rented, made money on it. But I was, that was the most miserable part of my life. Now, I was accomplishing a lot. People would go, are you kidding me? You're 27 years old, you own this, you own that, you have brand new cars, all this other stuff, have plenty of money. But I wasn't in my purpose. If you would have been around me then, you're like, this, is, this guy's the most confused, the most unstable, the most miserable person to be around. Why? Well, I wasn't walking in the purpose. I was not experiencing abundant life. When I first got born again, I started to realize, wow, I finally have stepped into purpose. But you see, purpose comes in degrees. Because it was also a time, after a number of years, and mind you, I was born again in 1984. By 1994, 10 years later, I'm miserable again. Why? I missed an opportunity to step out in the next level of purpose that God had for my life. So severely, that even though I had little children at the time, who were dependent upon me. I was again considering suicide. I had become so dissatisfied with church. I knew there was more. I knew there was more to experience. I knew there was more in in God that I was supposed to, more purpose. And so I set up a meeting with an individual who was like a spiritual mom to me. My wife was there with me. And I sat down with this person and I said to her, you know, I'm in a bad place. I've been in a bad place for about six months now. I said, and it's scaring me because I'm starting to consider things that that I was considering before I got born again. That's how bad the dissatisfaction had hit again. Now, I knew I was supposed to go into the ministry. I knew that I was supposed to be full time ministry. 
I knew these things. I knew that I was supposed to go to Bible school, but I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. That's why I'm saying sometimes you start out in purpose, but then you, you take a wrong turn. And so I said to this person, I'm going to end up doing one of three things, and it's going to happen within the next six months. I'm either going to commit suicide, or I'm going to completely backslide, or I'm going to go to Bible school. Thank God, choice number three is the one we followed. Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew. Some translations say recreated us. In Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. Now, that's well and that's fine, that's good and it's true. But let me just explain something to you. There are a couple of major lies that you and I begin to believe and those lies rob us of the reality of what's necessary for you and I to step into purpose. I'm talking about these lies. God doesn't really love me. God is still mad at me. God doesn't care about me. So if I believe that God doesn't really love me, that God doesn't care about me, if I believe these lies, it is, I am not going to pursue a purpose. I'm going to just settle into life, just let life happen around me, and I will live and die. I'll go to heaven, but I'll live and die, never fulfilling the purpose. And so because of that reason, and I have seen this in person after person after person in 32 years, who believe those lies, and some of us will never say it, but our actions and our life choices are major indicators that we're believing these lies. When a person is dissatisfied and frustrated and settles into dissatisfaction and frustration, you will never press through what you need to to walk in the purpose that God has for you. So I want to eliminate this junk right off the bat today before we get any further in this series. Okay? Now this series begins. Now you need to really pay attention, okay? So, the first part I want us to tackle today in these next minutes that we have left is what does God think of me? Now, the Word of God is God speaking to us. You realize that, right? That Bible that you have is God speaking to you. There's no better way to answer that question. What does God think about me than to go right to the scriptures and let the scriptures, not, not come up with some flowery story about God, not come up with some, uh, you know, sappy, just um, most of the time is more filled with man's tradition than it actually is the word of God. Let's go right to the word of God and let the word of God tell us what God thinks about me. Amen? Amen. You ready? I'm going to give you a bunch of scripture verses. We're not going to go into the scriptures. I'm going to kind of paraphrase them. You are valuable. I am the creator. You are my creation. I breathe into your nostrils the breath of life. Genesis 2.7. I created you in my own image. Genesis 1.27. My eyes saw your unformed substance. Psalm 139. I knit you together in your mother's womb. Psalm 139. I know the numbers of hairs on your head. Of course, with me, you had a lot less to worry about. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139. Exactly from the Word of God, specifically right from the Word of God, how he thinks about us. I crowned you with glory and honor as the pinnacle, the final act of the six days of creation, Psalm 8.5, Genesis 126. However, from the very beginning, you exchanged the truth about me for a lie, Romans 125. You have sinned and fallen short of my glory, Romans 3.23. And in your sin, you became spiritually dead, Ephesians 2.1. What you deserve is my righteous judgment, Psalm 7, verse 11 and 12. Yet in my great love, God says, I gave my unique son, that all those who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And that one's found where? John 3.16. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you, Romans 5.8. But sin doesn't have the last word, my grace does, Romans 5.20. Now everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. These are God's thoughts. These are God's, this is what he thinks about us. This is how he sees us. I have adopted you, Ephesians 1, 5. You are children of God, heirs of God, 1 John 3, 2, Romans 8, 16 and 17. You are no longer orphans. You belong to me, John 14, 18, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And I love you as a perfect father, 
1 John 3, 1. In my eyes, you are a brand new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All your sins are forgiven. 1 John 1, 9. You are now righteous in my sight with the very righteousness of my perfect son. Romans 4, 5. You have been saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8. You have been justified by faith. Romans 5, 1. Nothing will be able to separate you from my love in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 39. No one is able to snatch you out of my hand. John 10, 29, and I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. As you seek me and see more of my glory, I'm transforming you into the image of my son, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. You are my wonderful masterpiece. I recreated you for my purpose, Ephesians 2, 10. You are accepted in Christ, my beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. You are loved, Ephesians 1, 4. You are now my child, John 1, 12. You have access to me anytime you want, Ephesians 3.12. I love you with an everlasting love. You are no longer condemned, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Ephesians 2.19, I want to read to you. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. These scriptures tell us exactly how God sees us and what he thinks about us. And finally... Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says specifically God's thoughts towards us. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. There's no, there's no reason for you to have this foggy, half humanistic, half religious tradition idea of how God feels about you. The scriptures are extremely clear. Now, I submit this to you, that we need to remember that all of these things that he describes, how he feels towards us in these scriptures, are completely apart from our conduct. You listening? He has not said all these things in response to our good behavior, but he sees us as he does in response to Jesus' behavior because of his sacrifice, because of Jesus, we are accepted, we are loved. As new creations in Christ, God has sees us as forgiven, as cleansed, as righteous, and more importantly than ever, as his. We are his. And so the takeaway that I want us to leave with today, setting the stage for the future, why is it important that we discover and walk in our God-given purpose on the earth? Why is it important? <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. I want you to l- listen very carefully to this scripture. Because we're going to find out that the main reason for us to walk in our purpose and to discover our purpose is not so that I could, I feel so much better now. I, I really feel like I'm accomplishing some things. That's fine. But there's another reason that stretches into eternity why it's important for us to discover our purpose and to walk in our purpose. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. In other words, as long as we're alive here in this body, we're not living in his presence continuously. Verse 7. For we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and to be home with the Lord. Verse 9, so we make it our goal. What is he saying? While I'm still here in this body, we make it our goal to do what? Please him. Whether we're at home in the body or away from it. Verse 10, here is the reason. Scripturally speaking, taking into consideration eternity, the main reason that you and I need to pursue and to discover our purpose and walk in it is verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. What's he saying? We are going to be judged according to God's plan for our life. According to the measure that we actually accomplished, our purpose will be the determining factor of what reward we receive in eternity. What am I saying? Let me clarify this because I don't want you leaving on this note confused. That scripture does not say that that's a judgment where we'll be determined whether you go to heaven or hell. By virtue of the fact that you're standing in front of Jesus, 
By virtue of the fact that you made it this far, you're going to heaven. Okay? This judgment is not a judgment of the lost. This judgment is, a, is, is in other words, like a, uh, a rewards ceremony. Like an award ceremony. You, you have the most improved. You got the ones who really hung in there. You got the ones who, you know, whatever. This is going to determine what type of life we live in eternity, what rewards we receive. Now, mind you, whatever crowns we're giving, we're given, we're told that we put them right back at Jesus' feet because if it wasn't for him, we could accomplish nothing. But the fact is this. You and I, at some point in eternity, are going to have to stand before Christ and there's going to have to be an accountability. And so let me ask you this question. If we don't care about what purpose we live in on the earth, when we get to stand before him, what are we going to have to show? What evidence of our obedience will there be? What reward is he going to be able to hand out to us if we lived our entire life? Now we're saved, we're born again. And we're on our way to heaven. But if we lived our life not caring whether we accomplish what God created us for, tell me what in God's name are we going to give testimony to when we stand at this judgment seat? Are you listening to me? Are you hearing my heart? This is not a place where our sins are going to be real. This is going to be, hey, 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 Joe, I told you to start this outreach to this particular section of community. What did you do with it? Well, Lord, I, I really didn't think it was from you. I really didn't think it was serious. It was just a lot of work. It was just, I had too much on my plate. After all, look at what we're doing at the church and look at what all we did. But, but Joe, I, I asked you to do this. I created you for that purpose. In fact, those people, their personalities could, could have related to you so much. You could have made such, but you didn't do it. I know this is sobering. But this is a year of seriousness. This is a year for us to become sober. And I don't mean just absence of alcohol or some other kind of mind-altering substance. I'm talking about being sober about eternity and the fact that we're sowing. You are investing now in your eternity. Please, for the sake of the kingdom, <laughs> go find out what you're supposed to do and then do it. If it's within the means, if it's in the confines of this ministry, if you're supposed to be doing something, go do it. Step into it. If it has something to do with your career, which God's going to use to influence, then don't be afraid. Well, you know, I'm comfortable right now, Pastor. I, you know, I had this opportunity, but, you know, it's going to be a whole lot more work, and I don't really know if this is what I want to do. And, you know, I'm just getting to the place where I can take it easy a little bit. All right, well, you know, copy that, because when you stand in front of him, read it. I'm not trying to make Jesus out to be this mean dictator. It's not going to be a harsh time, but it's going to be a heart-to-heart, face-to-face. What did you do with what I invested in you? What did you do with the grace that I put upon your life? What did you do with the resources that I put at your disposal? What did you do with the time that I gave you? These are serious issues. Are you listening to me? Well, you know, we're under the age of grace. Yes, we're under the age of grace, and it's his grace that we make it to that point. Let's not take advantage of it. Let's not frustrate the grace of God. You are graced for a reason. It's the same as you are blessed for a reason. We are blessed to be a blessing. We have been graced so that we can be God's grace to someone else. It's important for us. So we're gonna start this journey over these next few weeks. We're going to talk about these different facets of purpose to get us to the place where we can go before God and say, Lord, am I doing what you call me? Am I doing why you, what you created me for? Am I fulfilling the purpose in your plan? Am I, do I fit? Am I, am, I do, am I still doing what you want? Did, was there a time when you wanted me to move on into something further and I didn't? Lord, what is it? And Lord, 
What is this dissatisfaction, if there is any? What is this dissatisfaction I'm feeling? Am I, am I totally out of the loop? Or was I supposed to take the next turn and I didn't? What is it, Lord? We want to be in God's timing. We want to be in God's purpose. We want to fit in God's plan. Amen? Amen. Just stand up, please. Thank you for watching today. We pray this message has impacted and blessed you. New Beginnings Church exists to lead people into a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to support the vision here at New Beginnings, just head over to our Give page. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.